On May 4th, 1961, following a 15 minute, 28 second suborbital space flight, Alan Shepard splashed down in the Atlantic Ocean in a Project Mercury spacecraft he named Freedom 7, becoming the first American to fly in space. Then, on July 21st, 1961, Astronaut Gus Grissom launched from Cape Canaveral and in a repeat of Shepard's feet, completed a 15 and a half minute space flight during which he reached an altitude of 102 nautical miles. Despite the sinking after splashdown of Grissom's spacecraft he called Liberty Bell 7, Grissom had successfully completed the mission's objectives. In the meantime, NASA was working to get man-rated the Atlas launch vehicle. Unlike the Redstone launch vehicle used to carry Shepard and Grissom into space, the more powerful Atlas booster was designed to achieve orbit. Even before Shepard's flight, NASA attempted a launch of an unmanned Mercury Atlas vehicle. The attempt made on July 29, 1960 culminated in a catastrophic structural failure of the launch vehicle 59 seconds after liftoff. A second effort at launching the Mercury Atlas combination on February 21, 1961 proved to be more successful. The booster reached a maximum altitude of 114 miles and the Mercury spacecraft was recovered over 1,400 miles downrange from Cape Canaveral. Once again, however, NASA suffered another spectacular setback during a launch attempt on April 25, 1961. 43 seconds after liftoff, and with the Atlas flying an unplanned trajectory, the range safety officer pushed a button causing the destruction of the vehicle and thus preventing damage and injury to property and people on the ground. Then, following the successful flight of Mercury Atlas IV on September 13, 1961, during which the Mercury spacecraft completed a single orbit of Earth, NASA set its sight on another launch this time with a living payload on board. On November 29, 1961, following a mission profile similar to that planned for an upcoming manned orbital flight, Enos, a five-year-old chimpanzee, was launched into space at 10.07 a.m. Eastern Standard Time. Despite the malfunction of the spacecraft's attitude control system allowing greater than planned for fuel consumption, and a problem with the environmental control system that resulted in an unsafe rise in the cabin temperature, Enos successfully splashed down three hours and 21 minutes after liftoff. The flight proved the effectiveness of the Mercury space capsule and the Atlas launch vehicle, thus qualifying both to carry a human into orbit. During a press conference held in early December 1961, NASA announced that former United States Marine Corps pilot John Glenn would be the first man to fly the Mercury Atlas vehicle into Earth orbit. Selected as one of America's original seven Mercury astronauts in 1959, the native of New Concord, Ohio had served as backup pilot to both Shepard and Grissom for their space flights. A veteran of World War II, Glenn flew the F-4U Corsair on 57 combat missions and earned two Distinguished Flying Crosses and 10 Air Medals. While serving as a Marine Corps pilot during the Korean War, Glenn flew the Grumman F-9F Panther jet aircraft on 63 combat missions. He would later pilot a much faster F-86 aircraft he dubbed the MiG Mad Marine on an additional 27 combat missions. Following the Korean War, Glenn reported to the Naval Air Station Patuxent River Naval Test Pilot School, during which he piloted an F-8U Crusader 2,445 miles in just over three hours and eight minutes, becoming the first person to complete a supersonic transcontinental flight across the United States and setting a speed record. Glenn was originally scheduled to lift off from Cape Canaveral's Launch Complex 14 on January 16, 1962, but problems with the Atlas rocket's fuel tanks pushed that date back to January 20th. Poor weather conditions on the new date selected pushed the launch date back again, this time to January 27th. 
On that date, Glenn boarded his spacecraft and waited for the countdown to reach zero. Thick clouds around the Cape caused another delay in the launch, however. A subsequent launch set for February 1st was also postponed due to a fuel leak in the Atlas fuel tanks. Poor weather delayed another launch attempt on February 14th as well. Then on February 20th, 1962, with the weather cooperating, Glenn prepared to board his spacecraft he named Friendship 7 in anticipation of a launch scheduled for later that day. Once suited up, Glenn departed Hangar S and headed to the transfer van for the ride to the launch pad. It was 6 a.m. when Glenn arrived at the launch gantry. Once there, he boarded the elevator for the ride to his awaiting spacecraft some 65 feet above him. When Glenn reached his spacecraft, he was met by a small group of technicians readying his spacecraft for launch, including fellow astronaut and backup commander Scott Carpenter. Once inside Friendship 7, Glenn would have to wait through an hour and a half delay in the countdown while ground crews tended to a problem with the Atlas rocket's guidance system. Two more holds ensued before the countdown reached zero at 9.47 a.m. Eastern Standard Time. Godspeed, John Glenn. Glenn later recalled that liftoff was slow. He remembered feeling the vibrations associated with the worst moments of aerodynamic stress being put on the vehicle as it continued to increase in velocity. Two minutes and nine seconds after launch, the booster engines cut off and fell away. Glenn was now 40 miles high and 45 miles downrange of Cape Canaveral. All systems are go. Glenn continued racing skyward towards a top speed of over 17,500 miles per hour. He was arcing out over the Atlantic Ocean toward Bermuda. Five minutes into the flight, Glenn achieved orbit. Roger, zero G, and I feel fine. Capsule is turning around. Oh, that view is tremendous. Roger, seven, you have a go at least seven orbits. Roger, understand go for at least seven orbits. John Glenn had become the first person to ride an Atlas booster to space and the first American to fly in Earth orbit. Twelve minutes after launch, Friendship 7 crossed the coast of Africa. By the time Glenn had crossed over the African continent toward the Indian Ocean a few moments later, he was already flying out of daylight. Then 53 minutes after launch, Glenn approaches Australia. That was sure a short day. Time passes rapidly, huh? Yes, sir. During his pass over Australia, astronaut and capsule communicator Gordon Cooper urged Glenn to be on the lookout for lights on the ground. Glenn then reported his observations. Just to my right, I can see a big pattern of light, apparently right on the coast. Uh, I can see a, the outline of a town and a very bright light just to the south of it. Cooper advised Glenn that he was seeing the Australian cities of Perth and Rockingham, specifically illuminated for Glenn's viewing. The lights show up very well, and I'll thank everybody for turning them on, will you? Soon, Glenn overflew Australia and headed out over the Pacific Ocean, into daylight, and toward the west coast of the United States. It was as Friendship 7 passed into sunrise that Glenn first observed what he called a huge field of particles that looked like tiny yellow stars around his capsule. He observed that there were thousands of them, like swirling fireflies. It was also at this point Glenn noticed the spacecraft had drifted out of yaw limits. Thrusters automatically fired to correct the problem, but each time one thruster ignited, the opposite thruster would then fire. They were igniting back and forth. The situation was not sustainable. Continued back and forth ignition would deplete the fuel supply and jeopardize the entire mission. 
The decision was made, therefore, to disable the automatic operation of the spacecraft's control system, placing Glenn in manual control of his spacecraft. Manual control enabled Glenn to regulate fuel consumption, but the problem persisted. At the same time, Glenn continued to be captivated by the swirling fireflies outside his spacecraft. I still have some of these particles that I cannot identify coming around the capsule occasionally, over. Uh, Roger, how big are these particles? Over. Uh, very small. I would indicate they're of the order of a sixteenth of an inch or smaller. Uh, they drift by the window, and uh, I can see them against the dark sky. Uh, just as it, just at sunrise, there were literally thousands of them. They looked like just a myriad of stars. Over. The mystery of the fireflies would have to wait for the second American to orbit Earth before it would be solved. It was during the flight of Aurora 7 on May 24, 1962, that Commander Scott Carpenter noticed that each time he struck the wall of his spacecraft, ice crystals that had formed outside were knocked free and floated away. Now two hours into the flight, Glenn was overflying Africa for the second time. On the ground, Capcom Gordon Cooper radioed Glenn asking about the status of the landing back switch inside the spacecraft. Defensive 7 we say Capcom. Uh, will you confirm that your landing back switch is in the off position, over? Uh, that is affirmative. Landing back switch is in the center off position. Tracking stations on the ground received telemetry indicating that the spacecraft's landing bag had been deployed in flight. The landing bag was designed to be deployed prior to splashdown to serve as a shock absorber to cushion the spacecraft and its occupant from the impact. Deployment of the bag prior to re-entering Earth's atmosphere posed a risk to the spacecraft's heat shield and threatened to potentially incinerate the vehicle. As Glenn crossed the Pacific Ocean for the second time, Mission Control was still speculating over the status of Friendship 7's landing bag. Then came a call from Hawaii Capcom. Friendship 7, this is Hawaii Capcom. Uh, now you can still consider yourself go for the next orbit. Affirmative, I am go for the next orbit. Roger, understand it. MCC confirms that they are go at the present time for third orbit. This is Mercury Control. We now have a contact with our Guaymas, Mexico station and with the Corpus Christi, Texas tracking station. The Friendship 7 spacecraft is now committed to its third orbit. This is Mercury Control. But even as Glenn was given the go for his third orbit, Mission Control continued wrestling to figure out if the landing bag had indeed deployed or if the indication that it had was false. The third orbit would prove to be the last for Glenn. The decision was made to cut the flight short and bring him home. Unsure of the status of the landing bag, NASA devised a strategy aimed at securing the heat shield to the spacecraft and hopefully preventing a fiery end to the flight. Uh, we'd like to leave the package on at least through Texas. The package, or retrograde package, was an array of three solid rocket engines that sat underneath the heat shield held in place by three hold-down straps and that were fired to slow the spacecraft for re-entry. So Keith tell him to keep his retro jettison switch off. Under normal operation, each rocket ignited for 10 seconds in five second intervals and once the engines burned out, the package would be jettisoned a minute later. Uh, John, leave your retro pack on uh, through your pass over Texas. 20 seconds. Right here. NASA managers hoped that by keeping the retro package in place, the heat shield would remain secured long enough for Glenn to complete his trip through the atmosphere. 20 minutes after being told of the potential landing bag problem, Glenn was seconds away from firing the retro rockets for the return to Earth. Five, four, three, two, one, fire. Roger, retros are firing. Oh, Roger, baby. Are they ever? It feels like I'm going back toward Hawaii. Even as Glenn commenced his descent, NASA advised him to leave the retro package in place for the entire passage through the atmosphere. Uh, we have decided to re-enter with the pack on. With the pack still in place during re-entry, it would meet a fiery end. But would the decision to leave it in place save the spacecraft and Glenn himself from the same fate? 
as Glenn streaked across the United States and into the radio silence created by the buildup of plasma around Friendship 7 during re-entry, mission controllers would have to wait to find out. As he plummeted toward Earth, Glenn observed flaming pieces of something stream past the spacecraft's window. He wondered if the intense heat outside the spacecraft might be felt inside the spacecraft at any moment. As re-entry continued, G-forces increased and Glenn watched a bright orange glow wrap around his capsule. Soon, Glenn re-established radio contact with Mission Control. Uh, seven, this is Chief. Uh, what's your general condition? You feeling pretty well? My condition is good, but that was a real fireball, boy. I had great chunks of that retro pack breaking off all the way through. With Friendship 7 safely through the atmosphere, attention next turned to splashdown and recovery of Glenn and his spacecraft. Main suit is on green, suit is out in reef condition at 10,800 feet in beautiful suit. As Glenn recalled, the spacecraft hit the Atlantic Ocean with a good solid thump, then plunged down before bobbing up to the surface. Four hours and 55 minutes since lifting off from Cape Canaveral, Friendship 7 had splashed down 800 miles southeast of Bermuda and a mere six miles from the prime recovery vessel USS NOAA. Within 20 minutes, crews from the USS NOAA had secured Glenn and his spacecraft and shortly he was returned to the vessel and to a hero's welcome. The flight was a great success despite the difficulties encountered. It represented a major milestone in the development of crewed space flight, establishing definitively man's ability to live and work in space and clearing the way for more ambitious missions. Please be sure to subscribe and click the notification button to see more upcoming videos on the history of the early days of the manned space program. Thanks again for watching Manned Space.